So many stories fill the pages of life. Some chapters you can be proud to tell. Others you would rather skip. The day life really turns a page is when you let God be the author of your story. Let God write your story and you'll live a story worth telling. My story, I decided to start. Hey, welcome everybody and a big happy new year to all of you. Today we're starting a brand new four week series called my story. How many of you love a good story? Anybody love a good story? All of our churches? I think we all do. It's always fun when you get together with somebody and you start telling stories. I got to tell you about the time when, and you tell stories. And the great news is every single one of you have stories about your life that you love to tell. Let me tell you about the time there was a problem and I overcame it. Let me tell you about the time I set a goal and I accomplished it. Let me tell you about the time I made the right decision. Let me tell you about the funny time when I did something really, really stupid. We've got stories that we love to tell, but unfortunately, all of us have stories that we'd rather leave untold, right? Maybe even entire chapters of our lives that we'd rather not tell anybody. Maybe even you go and try to edit some of the old stories and change them just a little bit, even lie about them or leave parts out or make some parts sound better than they really were because there's some parts of our story that we're really ashamed of and really wish that we had never been a part of. What's so interesting to me is to think back over my life and to realize how many seemingly insignificant decisions had really a significant impact on the direction of my life. Do any of you ever think about that? You go back and you think, you know, somebody invited me to be a part of the co-ed softball team, and so I decided to go play co-ed softball, and four of the players all happened to go to church, and I wasn't a church person, but they invited me to church, and so I thought, I might as well, I kind of like these people, and what could it hurt? And I went in, and I heard this message, and something happened, and God got a hold of my life, and oh my gosh, my whole life is totally different, and I can trace it back to a simple decision to go play softball, or Maybe you were in college and you thought, I gotta take in a class, some elective, and there was this one class and I heard it was an easy A and so I enrolled in that class and I didn't even care about the subject, but all of a sudden I fell in love with the subject and I changed my major and now I've got a great career based on that one simple, seemingly insignificant decision to enroll in a class. And sometimes we look back at life and say, wow, I can't believe the way that decision impacted my story. The other side is true though as well, the stories aren't always positive. Sometimes we look back and we think, man, I had no idea how that, that, that seemingly small decision would impact my life in such a negative way. I look back and think, I wish I hadn't started that, or wish I'd never said that, or I wish I'd never gone there, or I wish I'd never become friends with that person because when I made that decision, I had no idea how my life would start to unravel. Think about it this way. The decisions that we made yesterday determine the stories that we'll tell today. And as we approach a new year, I want you to think of it this way moving forward and really internalize the power of this truth that the decisions that we make today will determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. Our decisions really matter. I think back to uh, my time in college when I was uh, considering studying for a big exam that was several days away when some guys came in and said, hey, um, you wanna go to a party? I was like, absolutely, I wanna go to a party. Who would rather go to a party than study anybody that I know? And so I started to go and I just stopped and I realized, wait a minute, I am not doing great in this class. I really need to study. And so I decided to go to the library to study. And I, I cannot imagine how different my life would be had I made the decision to go to the party instead. I went to the library, was sitting down studying. A girl from my class that I'd never met came up and said, hey, 
Craig, I've, you know, I know of you, and we started talking, and our conversation turned towards spiritual things. I was a brand new Christian, and I said, I gotta tell you how God's changed my life, and she said, I gotta tell you how I don't believe in God and don't like people who do, and so uh, our, basically, our new friendship was based on me trying to convince her of the goodness of God and her making fun of me and calling me really, really weird. Well, about two months later, that very same girl came up to me in the business department and said, hey, weird guy, um, there's this girl that you need to meet and she's totally weird like you. She's in love with God, crazy with God, and you need to meet her and her name is Amy. Ooh, baby, that was, <laughs> when I look back, I think about the decision to go to the library impacted my life and that, to the point where that's where I met the woman of my dreams. And so the moral of the story is if you're hoping to get married, don't go to the party, go to the library <laughs> and study, right? Go to the library and study. It's amazing the way the decisions we make determine the stories we tell. I wanna say it again, the decisions that you make today will determine the stories you'll tell tomorrow. So the big question I wanna to ask today is, how do we live a story worth telling? How do we live a life that produces a story that we want to tell? And the answer, I believe, is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, which will be our key verse for this study. And as you launch this new year, I pray that this would be true of you. The writer to the Hebrews said what? He said, let us fix our eyes on whom? He said, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who is what? Would you all say it aloud? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Wouldn't it be amazing if you let Jesus, the Son of God, become the author of your life and help you live the story that God wanted you to tell? How do we live a story worth telling? I believe we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and he will help us tell the story that God wants us to tell. So here's what we're gonna do in the next four weeks. We're gonna make four decisions, and I want every single one of you to be a part of this every single week. We're gonna make four decisions. Week one, we're gonna decide to start. Today, we're going to start a discipline that helps us tell the story that God wants us to tell. Next week, we're gonna decide to stop. All of us have behaviors, mindsets, attitudes that hinder us from living the story that God wants us to live, and we're gonna stop one thing that is interrupting the story. The third week, we're gonna decide to stay. We're gonna decide to stay when it would be easier to go because so often we quit on something important when it would be better to stay. We quit on God, we quit on the church, we quit on a friendship, we quit on a dream, we quit on a marriage, when it would really be better to stay and we're gonna decide to stay the course. Week four, we're gonna decide to go when it would be easier to stay. Because I can promise you, every single one of you, in order to tell the story God wants you to tell, you're gonna have to, at some point, and probably several points in your life, take a significant step of faith and leave what's comfortable and leave what's known to honor God. It would be easier to stay, but you're gonna decide to go. We're gonna decide to start, stop, stay, and go. Today I wanna talk to you about deciding to start a discipline that can be life transforming. Now, I don't want you to start, about, start thinking about starting a business or think about starting writing your book or think about starting um, a ministry. That's week four. Today what we're doing is we're talking about starting a discipline. In fact, um, how many of you were here with us for the series from this day forward, all of our churches from this day forward? Uh, in that series, we talked about a keystone habit from one of my favorite books I read last year called The Power of Habit, and I wanna revisit that thought because it is so, so, so powerful. The authors of that book um, tell us that there are certain habits, certain disciplines, that when you practice those habits, they cascade forward into positive momentum and other positive habits. 
in the same way that the presence of those disciplines create other positive disciplines, the absence of those very key and specific disciplines create the absence of other disciplines and we all have them. That one certain something, that if we're doing this, then we're disciplined and and moving forward. Or when we're not doing that one thing, our disciplined lifestyle starts to unravel. Um, How many of you remember what my keystone habit is? It is never quit what? Never quit flossing, right? Yeah. Dental hygienists around the world love this part of my teaching, never quit flossing. And it's not because I really care a lot about my gums. I really don't care that much, but for me, I never quit flossing because this is the first discipline to go in my life. And when I do floss, which I don't want to do, I feel disciplined, therefore my disciplined mind says it's important to work out, and I do, and then I feel better, so I eat better, and since I'm working out and eating better, I sleep better, therefore I wake up early in the morning, and I do my daily version Bible plan, and I go to work full of the presence of God, therefore I'm productive, I leave on time because I was productive, I come home in a good mood, I see Amy, she says you're awesome, I say she's awesome, and we have six kids because I never quit flossing. (laughs) Do you see how that works, okay? Now, if you look at the other side of it, if I quit flossing, I don't feel very disciplined. And so since I'm not a real disciplined person, I don't go to the gym. And since I don't go to the gym, I don't feel motivated to eat right. And since I'm not taking care of myself, I don't sleep good. Therefore, I don't wake up on time. And when I do wake up, I'm grumpy. And so I don't do my Bible study. And so I go to work in a bad mood and people are mad at me and I'm unproductive so I have to stay late. And so I'm going home late and I'm really late. I know I'm in trouble with Amy so I drive really, really fast. And then a police officer tries to pull me over but I'm in a bad mood because I didn't read my Bible. So I try to outrun the police officer only to be arrested by a barricade of people blocking my driveway. Then I go to jail all because I didn't. Thank you. Okay. Now, exaggerating slightly, yes, I admit that. But you all have those disciplines in your life that create positive momentum and the absence of those disciplines end up creating negative momentum. Today we're going to decide to start a discipline that can transform our lives. And we're going to look each week at different Old Testament stories where we see um, the Old Testament people making decisions that change the direction of their lives. Today we're gonna look at Daniel in the lion's den. Everybody say lion's den. Which shows that even in Old Testament times, cats were a problem even back (laughs) then. Now, if you know the story, uh, Daniel was uh, looked favorably upon by King Darius. King Darius selected 120 satraps. These were like governors uh, to rule the territory. He picked three men to be over the 120. Daniel was one of the three. Daniel so stood out in his integrity and his leadership skills that the king said, I want to put Daniel in charge over everyone. And the other 120 guys were jealous and said, we got to put a stop to the teacher's pet, Daniel. And so we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. Stop right there. What were they doing? They were looking for a little dirt. Let's find some trash. Let's find some reason to to make charges against this guy, but they couldn't. The Bible says they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Why was he trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent? I'll tell you why in a moment. Verse 5. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they came up with a plan. You can read all the details. They basically went to the king and they said, hey, king, we've got a great idea. Wouldn't it be awesome that for the next 30 days, no one would be allowed to pray to anyone or any god except for you, O king. And if they pray to any other god, then you throw them into the lion's den. And the king said, that sounds pretty cool to me. Let's make a law. 
No one prays to anyone but me, and if they do, they're thrown into the lion's den. Why was Daniel looked upon favorably? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was there no corruption found in him? Why did the king promote him in his leadership? Why did God show favor upon Daniel in the lion's den and deliver him from the mouth of the hungry pussycats? Okay, why? I'll show you why. Because years ago, Daniel made a decision to start doing something that made him into the man of integrity that he became. Let me show you what his decision was. Verse 10, Daniel 6. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where there was windows open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and did what? All of our churches say loud, and he prayed, giving thanks to his God, read this last phrase together, just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. Think about this. Who knows for how long? Certainly weeks, more likely months, perhaps years, maybe more than a decade, three times a day, Daniel stopped whatever he was doing, made an appointment with his one true king and God, knelt down before God and aligned his heart to God, worshiped his God, prayed that his God's will would be done in his life. Why was he successful? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was he looked upon favorably by the king? Why did he rise in influence? Because he made a decision to start three times a day praying to his God, and God transformed his story into the story that God wanted Daniel to tell. The decisions we make determine the stories that we tell. I wanna pose two questions to you. The first question is very simple. I want you to ask yourself the question, what does God want you to want? What does God want you to want? Another way to phrase it would be, what is the story that God wants you to tell? Five years from now, in your life, what story does God want you to tell? What does God want you to want in the future? And I bet any of you, if you're really honest, you'll sit back and say, well, yeah, there is this one part of my area, area of my life that's not where it should be, or, or the chapter I'm writing right now, it's not gonna end well unless I make some changes. What story does God want you to tell? And for some of you, it might be um, a different financial story. And if you start a discipline today, and I don't know what that would be, you start to budget, or you start to, you start a financial class, you start to get a mentor, you start cutting up your credit cards, or whatever. But if you start getting a hold of your finances today, five years from now, your story could go something like this. You know, I can barely even believe it, but five years ago, we were living paycheck to paycheck and we were drowning in debt. But we started, fill in the blank, and now, after five really disciplined and hard-fought years, we're completely out of debt. No more credit card debt, no more student loan debt. We paid off everything but the house, and we're on track to pay it off in less than seven years. And that could be your story if you start the discipline today that allows you to tell the story later. It could be some of you, God wants you, for you to have uh, the right priorities, because you don't right now. And it could be five years from now, if you start the right discipline today, your story might be like something like this. Well, yeah, you know, several years ago, I wasn't a good husband or a good mom or a good, uh, a good uh, spouse, and I was pursuing my career more than anything else, and it was my God to me. And I, and I told myself that I was doing this for my family, but I was really doing it for myself. And, 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 I, and I, I started to come home every day at 6 o'clock, or I started to leave my work at the office or whatever. But now it's totally different. I've got the marriage that I've always wanted, and my kids know me, and I know them, and I'm involved in their lives. That could be your story if you'll start the discipline today. It could be, some of you, it's, it's more of a story about the way you take care of your body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
You may be able several years from now to tell a story like this. Well, it's, it's hard to believe, but a few years ago, I actually weighed 38 pounds more than I do today or 72 pounds or whatever the number is. And, and, and it's, it's so amazing because I just decided to start eating right or I started a diet or I, I started exercising or, or I started whatever, but now I feel better about myself and I've got a better ministry because I've got m more uh, better uh, self-image and, and my whole life is different because I started a discipline that helped me tell the story God wants me to tell. What does God want you to want? And here I want every one of you to just take some time, whether now or later, and write down in the little blank what God wants you to want. And now let me bring the application question to you, and that is this. Based on what God wants you to want, based on the story that you know God wants you to tell, answer this question. What do you need to start? What do you need to start in order to tell the story that God wants you to tell? What do you need to start to live a story worthy of telling. And here's the key. What I want you to do is pick one thing and one thing only. Because every single one of you, you're going to be tempted to do what I'm tempted to do. I look at my life and go, I need like four things or seven things or all these different things. And, and the truth is, if you try to do seven things or nine things, you're not going to do any things. You pick one and you commit to one. You pray, you ask God, what do you want me to want? What story do you want me to tell? Then, what discipline do you need to start today to tell that story in the future? And let me just tell you a few of the disciplines that I've started because this is something that I've done um, every year since I've been married. Start one new discipline every year. I'll tell you a few of the ones that are most important to me. Um, early in the ministry, I did not know how to stop working because there was always more to do and because I was insecure in all my own jacked up problems of trying to prove myself. And so I didn't take good care of myself. And the leaders of the church came and they said, you need to take good care of yourself. I started two disciplines, um, two consecutive years. The first year they said, you need to work out and take care of your body because basically the principle is those of you who want to make a difference in ministry, somebody said this, uh, they said, you can't have a spiritual ministry without a physical body. Pretty simple, right? In other words, when you're dead, your spiritual ministry is over on earth. You've got to take care of yourself. And so they, I said, I don't have time to work out. They said, you don't have time not to work out. So I made a decision to make exercise a priority. That was 19 years ago. Uh, I invited my friend John to be my workout partner. And 19 years later, I have the same workout partner, and we work out three or four times a week. And for a guy in his middle 40s, I'm not in bad shape. Okay? Why? I made a decision to start. Also during that period, I, I really was battling with workaholism, and the, uh, the leaders of the church said, you will burn out and you will be a casualty unless, unless you get this under control. I decided to start counseling. I submitted myself to counseling to find out why I was so messed up and why I was trying to prove myself and what unbiblical mindsets I had. And now my story is very, very different. In fact, when my children tell their story, Guess who's going to be a part of it in a good way? Their dad is. You know what their story could have been? Just like so many other preacher's kids. Well, my dad neglected us and he loved the church and we didn't really feel loved or valued. But instead, because I made a decision to start and get help, now my children will say, dad was involved in our lives. He didn't miss our dance recitals. He didn't miss our 73 soccer games on Saturdays. You know, he was involved with us in every way. He prayed with us every night, read us stories. And my dad was a good dad. The reason that we'll tell that story is because I made a decision to start. Let me tell you a couple others. Um, when I became a pastor, I was 22 years of age. Why well, I didn't become a Christian until I was 19, almost 20. And so I was a brand new Christian. And people would ask me questions. Pastor Craig, what does it mean in the Bible when it says such and such in this book of the Bible? And I'd be like going, is that a book in the Bible or is that a trick question? I didn't know. I didn't know the Bible. So I was very insecure. So I made a decision to start reading through the Bible cover to cover every year. 15 years or so ago, I started reading the Bible, and now I've read it through 15 or so times, 
and I'm not a Bible scholar by any means, but I know the Bible better because I made a decision to start. Four years ago, I realized that I was um, carrying too much of the weight of the church and ministry personally, and I wanted more of God's power. So I decided to start fasting 21 days at the beginning of each year. This will be my fourth or fifth uh, fast, and our staff does it every year, and many of you do it with us. I deny myself physical nutrition, and that's why I get thinner in uh, the first of the year, and, um, but I'm seeking spiritual nutrition, and the last four or so years of ministry have been significantly different and richer and more powerful and more fruitful because I decided to start a discipline that helps me tell the story God wants me to tell. So here's the question for you. What does God want you to start? In light of what God wants you to want, what does he want you to start? What discipline? Some of you, um, you might have an insecurity, might be a, an overeating problem, it might be an addiction, it might be um, a, uh, inappropriate quest for material things, it might be um, bad thought process, it might be unforgiveness, and you need to start counseling. You need to submit yourself to someone else who has the wisdom to say, here's the lies that you're believing, and here's what the Bible says, and you need to renew your mind with truth, or you're continuing to build your life on lies. You need to start counseling. Some of you, you might be, um, you might be married, and your marriage is not what it could be or should be. And you know it, but you've just been floating along. And so you may need to start something that helps your marriage. Start, you might decide to start praying together. It's amazing what praying together every, do will, every day will do for your marriage because you can't be real mad for real long if you're going to pray together. You've got to work things out. It's real hard to look at pornography when you know you've got to pray with your wife later on that day. It's real hard to hold unforgiveness in your heart when you know you have to pray with your spouse. And so you may create the discipline of praying together. Or it might be reading the Bible together, reading a book together. Or maybe you haven't been alone because you've got kids everywhere and you haven't seen each other without the kids since 1979. And so you're going to start a date night every week. And you may look back and say, well, back when we started getting alone for two, three hours a week, it totally changed our marriage. Some of you... When you look at your spiritual life, it's flat. It's not where it should be. And so you may start making church a real priority in your life. Not just going whenever it's convenient and not just going, but, but getting involved in it, using your gifts to make a difference in it, contributing financially, being a prayer warrior for it, engaging in, in the community of it. You may start making church a real priority. Or some of you might start to open up in a, in a community of a life group and, and have others speak into your life and, and to know others genuinely and to be known and to bear your soul and to ask for help and to have others pray for you. You may need to start being a part of a life group. Or you may need to start making God's word a real priority in your life. So, I mean, you wanna be strong spiritually, you feed on his word. I don't know what you need to start but chances are you do if you seek God. What story does God want you to tell? Do you want to live a story worth telling? Or one day do you want to be embarrassed by this chapter of your life? The decisions that you make today will determine the story that you tell tomorrow. In fact, I want to show you a, a really cool story to me, and hopefully this will motivate you from 1 Kings chapter 20 uh, verses 13 and 14, I'll just read it to you because I, I believe it, it speaks very directly. Uh, this is about King Ahab of Israel when a prophet said, God's going to give this opposing army into your hands. Verse 13, meanwhile, a prophet came to Ahab, king of Israel, and announced, this is what the Lord says. Do you see this vast army? It's this opposition. I will give it into your hand today, and then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 14, the king asked the question that we would ask, but who's going to do this? Who will do this? The prophet replied, this is what the Lord says. The young officers to the provincial commanders will do it. And then Ahab asked the question, everybody ask it aloud with me, and who will start the battle? 
Let's say it again. Who will start the battle, he asked. And the prophet said, who will? Somebody answer me. The prophet said, you will. I want to ask you a question. Who's going to start the discipline that will help you tell the story God wants you to tell? If you will, say, I will. One, two, three, I will. Who's going to start it? I will. Who's going to start it? I will. Look at your neighbor and say, I'll start it. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know about you, but I will. I will. I will. Who's going to start the battle? Who's going to start the decision today that will help you tell the story God wants you to tell? I will. I will. Who's going to start it? I will. Who's going to start it? You will. You will. Because if you seek God, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He will help you author the right story. And Daniel prayed three times a day, just as he had done before. Why did God look favorably on Daniel? Why was he a man of integrity? Why was he trustworthy? Why could 120 men find no fault in him? Because at some point in his life, Daniel made what others would think was an insignificant and very small decision. He decided three times a day, I'm gonna align my heart with God And because of that decision, he was able to tell the story that God wanted him to tell. You can live a story worth telling if you'll decide to start what God wants you to start today. Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to your church and God, that we would truly live your story, making you known a story worth telling. All of our churches, As you take a moment to pray um, today, I want to ask you a very specific and very direct question. And I don't want you to respond just yet, but the question I'm going to ask you is, will you start? Will, Will you start? Will you seek God and start one discipline that can change your story? And the reason I don't want you to answer yet is because I don't want you to make an emotional decision. I want you to really be focused. If you respond yes, I want it to be a tremendously spiritual decision, not just New Year, New Year's resolution. I'm talking about fixing your eyes on Jesus, really asking yourself, what story does God want you to tell? What does he want you to want? In light of what he wants you to want, what do you need to start? To seek God, to make a commitment, not to start three things, not to start five things, but to start one discipline that God calls you to start that will help you tell the story that he wants you to to tell all of our churches who's in, who's going to start this battle. If you will, lift up your hands right now. All over our churches, lift up your hands and say, I will. Who will start this battle? I will. Father, thank you today for hands lifted at churches around this world of those who are calling on you, who will start the battle and the disciplines that will help us tell the story that you want us to tell. God, I pray that they would hear specifically from you. God, that they would know what chapter they're writing that won't have the ending you want it to have. And God, instead of telling a story we're ashamed of or embarrassed by, God, that we would, we would rewrite and allow Jesus to reauthor the story of our lives. God, give us wisdom to start what you want us to start so we can live the way you want us to live, so we can tell the story you want us to tell. God, thank you in advance. There will be those that will look back to this moment and say, oh, back several years ago, I was at church and I heard this message and I decided to, and oh my gosh, it's totally changed my story. As you keep praying today at all of our different churches, uh, let me just tell you this. There are those of you that your story is about to change in this moment. Your story is about to change. Years from now, you're going to look back and say, oh, it was the beginning of a new year, and I just happened to be at church. I was, I was at church online. I was visiting a church. I, I went to church, and I realized I claimed to believe in God, but my life didn't really reflect his goodness, and I decided to make him first. 
Some of your, your story might be, I, I wasn't a church person, I wasn't religious, I didn't even really know where I stood with God, but I just, I happened to hear something one day and I realized, oh my gosh, I do believe there is a creator bigger than this world, and I do want to live for him. And then I did recognize my need for him, so I called on him, and oh my gosh, my life is different because of that moment. There are those of you who you're under the weight of your sin right now, the guilt. Where do I stand with God? And one day you'll look back and say, I felt so guilty and I felt so bad and I wondered, could God ever love me? Could he ever forgive me? And I decided to make Jesus not only my Savior, but the Lord of my life. And I was forgiven and I was transformed and now I'm free. Now I've got a ministry to others at my, my work. Now I've got a church family that's my home. Now I've got a purpose to live for. Now I'm living for something beyond myself, but I'm living for the goodness and the kingdom of God. Your story's about to change. All of our different churches, those of you that recognize, yeah, I may believe in God, or yeah, I'm not a church guy, but all of a sudden, something is drawing me to the goodness of God, and I recognize my need for him. I am a sinner, and I need a savior. I believe Jesus is the son of God who died for me and rose again so I could live for him. Today, my story is going to change because I'm gonna surrender my life. It's no longer my life, it's going to be his life. I give it to him. I need his grace. I need his goodness. I need his forgiveness. I need his purpose. My life is no longer my own. My story is going to change because through Christ, I give my life to God. That's your prayer today at all of our different churches. Your story is about to change. That's your prayer. Lift your hands high right now. All over the place, lift them up and say yes. That's me here in this middle section. God bless you. And right back here, way back here toward the back, praise God for you. Others of you here in this middle section, back toward the back, over here on my side, fantastic. Way back here, all the way on the back, here in the section toward the back as well. Praise God for you, and up here close to me. Church Online, you click right below me, right back over here toward the back, way back here in this back section too. Others of you today, come on, you know it. Your story's gonna change because you're no longer living for you. Over here on this side, now you're living for Christ. You need his grace, you need his forgiveness. Ma'am, right here in the middle, others who say, yes, Jesus, take my life. Right back over here in this section as well. Praise God, a hand raised high. Everybody pray aloud with those around you. Pray, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. My life is not my own. I trust it to you. Fill me with your spirit so I could live the story you want me to live. Today I give you my life. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Life Church, would you worship big? Give God glory and praise and welcome those whose stories have just changed.